Welcome to the NCS podcast. This is the master class series. I'm Dr. Stefan Mayer of New York Medical College and Westchester Medical Center in New York, and I'm one of your co-hosts. Hello, this is John Rosenberg from Westchester Medical Center. I'm your other co-host. We have a we have a really esteemed guest here today. Uh, many of you may uh, know, or at least may more have heard of. Um, Molberg CNS monitoring, and we are here with the uh, the founder and the inventive mind behind this multimodality monitoring platform. We're here with Dick Molberg. So, Dick, welcome, welcome to the show. Well, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Welcome. So, for those that don't know, I'll give a little background. I got initially involved in the neurocritical care world in the uh, early '90s, and Dick Molberg has been a continual an important presence in our field uh, from that time and probably even before. And so what I wanted to do uh, to start, Dick, is ask a little bit about your origin story. How did you get involved in neuromonitoring in the first place? Sure, but you know, now I don't want this to be like a political date where you ask, uh, you know, a debate where you ask me one question, I pivot to another. But I just wanted to tell a story first, right? So I first met you, and so where I first met you, Stephanie, we were we flew into Cleveland together. I remember this well, and we were going to Mike DeGeorge's meeting. He used to have these great meetings on multimodal monitoring. Remember those? Oh yeah, yeah. And and we shared a cab <laughs> to Case Western together. And in, in that cab ride, you started telling me about who you were and all this stuff. And and at the end of the cab ride, I said, you know, this guy's a complete nut. And, and I said, I have to I have to get to know him, you know. And so over the years, you know, I just want to tell you, you have been uh, I did get to know you very well. And you've been an amazing mentor to me. You know, I think you taught me the clinical side of multimodal monitoring. I mean, I had a little bit of that and I was more on the industry side. So. You know, and you were a fun person to work with. And I just wanted to thank you, you know, for being my mentor and having fun. And, you know, that's what life's all about, right? Learning and fun. So thank you so much for that. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah well, thank you very much. It's It's been a, a great uh, working relationship and friendship. Yeah, well, thanks. So, so how did I get into this? Well, I don't know how far back you want to start, but... Um, I guess the first, um, so I always, so my mother always wanted a doctor, right? You know, like a lot of mothers, right? Probably like your mothers. You know? and, and so I was in this academic path, you know, I was at Penn and then I was at Jefferson and I, I was kind of taking a leave to finish a PhD in this um, professor at Penn that I knew in the engineering school. I met him in a parking lot and he said, you know, I just started this new little company and uh, back then, this was in the early days of microprocessors where there weren't any books, there weren't any classes, and I just picked it up myself. He said, we want to build this little microprocessor-based uh, device. And so he said, will you come join us? And I said, sure. And I figured, well, maybe I can finish my PhD there, right? So I joined the company, and a year into it, we realized we we couldn't do it. It was just was going to cost too much and everything. And to that, I've been working in a neurosurgery department doing intraoperative monitoring. And I built this huge rack of, you know, a mini computer and the stuff that was available way back then uh, in the late 70s to do evoke potential in the EEG. And um, so I knew that. And I said, you know, I bet we could miniaturize that. And and so I went back uh, to this company. I was out at lunch one day with with this guy that worked with me, Gary Trapezano. We, we were saying, OK, this product's not going to work. Do we have any ideas for this? And so we brought the idea back to them. They said, yeah, let's go for it. And that turned into a little two-channel EEG and a vote mm -hmm. monitor that we sold all over the place for anesthesia. And, you know, and you know, when you have an idea, a lot of people have ideas, but when you have an idea that actually turns into a product and you see it sold, it just it, you know, it it possesses your mind, you know. And so mm -hmm. I, ended up, I ended up, you know, leaving leaving the, the PhD and MD stuff behind. And I said, this is what I want to do. And so um, we did that. And then I that company grew in another direction. I spun off my first company from that. And we kind of did a different version of that. We worked with Hewlett Packard on that. And so the first 20 years of my career were really in intraoperative monitoring. But it really was the first days of 
of kind of multimodal monitoring. I think that kind of started in intraoperative because they wanted to do EEG evoke potentials, you know, for spine. And then yeah. they started adding uh, TCD in there. And so we ended up developing this product that would get, do TCD in those three modalities. And, um, you know, and now, the, and now they do motor evokes, they do all this stuff. And that field kind of got, it kind of got crowded. A lot of other companies came in there and uh, everything. And then, uh, so I ended up seeing this opportunity in critical care. Now I had worked for a neurosurgeon before that and head trauma was kind of what I was interested in. And so I went into a neuro IC and ICU and that was right at the time when some of these new little devices were coming out. Like, like uh, Wolfgang Fleckenstein had just invented the Lycox, you know, over in Germany and it was just starting to come into the US and, and, you know, ICP monitors and all this data was, you know, just in different devices. And I said, you know, well, maybe we could do that for the ICU. And so we started out doing that and, you know, um, and here we are. But <laughs> yeah, but I, I seem to remember um, the first time I was aware of what you were doing before I even met you, you didn't you have like a little four track EEG? Yeah, we did. Yeah stick on the underside of the bedside monitor, like a Delta track. Is that what it was called? No, it wasn't. We had, it was called a neuro track. And, neuro. and so we had, um, the first one I did was two channels of EEG and, and just two of somatocentry of oak potentials. And then the second one we did, we actually took the Hewlett Packard patient monitor and we rebuilt a, a, a box for it to turn it into a, a brain monitor. So it did uh, eight channels of yeah. EEG and, and then uh, did simultaneous evoke potentials, which was kind of cool. And then we connected one of the TCD devices. And one of the things that got me into ICU also was Tom Bleck bought some of these for uh, when he was down at UVA. And Paul Vespa was there, you know, uh, doing his training. So I met him early on. And, and Tom was the first guy to look at this, look at the continuous, I think, process DEG in an ICU. And one day he he says, I got to show you something, you know, and and so I actually flew down there and I think and he had recorded uh, long EEG, long term EEG and looked at the spectral edge frequency and power bands of a seizure of a patient having continual seizures. And it's the first time you were able to see those recorded on a, you know, on a process EEG and I said, wow, that's so cool. And he got excited about it. And that that also kind of helped me launch into the ICU. With that, so. Yeah. So for the audience, just so that to help the audience understand, in the beginning, when EEG first started moving into the ICU, we actually had no idea that story had not been written about the prevalence and importance of non-convulsive seizures and non-convulsive status. We didn't even know it was going on. It was like a, we started using the devices for fun. And I remember very well thinking, oh, we're going to get diffuse slowing in everyone. It's going to be useless. But then, you know, seizures, seizures, seizures. You you know, and that's, you know, now, as we know, if you do surveillance EEG on anyone in a coma, 20 to 30 percent of them at some point, you're going to pick up seizures. And the vast majority are totally asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic and hard to figure out. Yeah, and I... I um... I, I got another, uh, had kind of another mentor at, at CHOP, the Children's Hospital here in Philly. There's a guy named Bob Clancy. And he he started studying, um, you know, neonatal seizures and the prevalence of seizures in neonates that you didn't know. And he published this work where uh, there were there was a very high prevalence of these, he called it the silent seizures or non-convulsive seizures in neonates, you know, the ones with HIE and all that. And they used my early little monitor for that study. And so... I got interested in that, um, you know, quite a long time ago. And then, Stefan, I have to say that the paper that your your group wrote from Columbia that showed the association of seizures, you know, with things like ICP and, and brain oxygen and all that, that it came out in 2010, that just blew me away because, you know, it, it you were seeing these things. But then I think, and maybe it was Jan or somebody that, that correlated DEG now with all the other physiology. And, mm -hmm. and that was just... That was just amazing. And and I said, this is this is where we got to work. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, the physiologic cost of what seizures can do to brain tissue, it's it's quite remarkable. I, I also remember um, Timothy Pedley was the head of epilepsy when I started out in neurology. We're talking 92. And he gave 
to talk to the residents on status. And I remember very well, he said, it, there's some debate as to whether or not seizures can actually leave lasting injury to the brain. It was an open question at that time. People weren't really sure if they mattered. And more incredibly, when seizures were being picked up on EEG, um, a lot of times neurologists were called in and they went, eh, what's the big deal? A little couple seizures here and there never hurt anyone. Um, John, let me ask you, um, in your training, how, how were you taught about the, the approach towards seizures and status in the, in the ICU? Were, was it still ambivalent and uncertain that these things need to be wiped out immediately or what? I think there's two, there's two approaches to seizures, uh, to, to bad seizures in the ICU. There's, um, if it's there, like put it away, treat, 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 seamless response. And then there's, if it's there, let's think about it. Are these, I guess for seizures, we all, let me take a step back. For seizures, we all think seizures are bad and we do want to reduce seizure burn and we want to figure out what is causing the seizures and alleviate and take away that cause. In terms of that interictal continuum, that step before seizures, or there's a little bit of, um, and even with, in certain cases, seizures, there's the kind of philosophy of let's just treat it. If it's there, we should treat it, make it go away. And there's also the philosophy of, in the larger context, of what we're doing to treat these seizures actually harming the patient. And I think, you know, there, we all have had certain cases where are we going to maybe, um, put the patient through heavy, heavy sedation, burst suppression, just to reduce a few seizures. If we don't think those seizures are causing the actual um, yeah. mental stuff. So I think that's, that's kind of the, uh, I would say that's the game we love and hate to play. And I think I've definitely been exposed to different ends of the spectrum. And that's what's fun when you learn from your mentors and you develop your own style of, you know, how, how aggressive do you want to be on one side of the spectrum versus the other? But yeah. in general, I do feel like as a, as a neurologist, and as a neurointensivist, we are we we take seizures seriously. We definitely err on the side of reducing seizures. Yeah, I err on the side of completely eliminating them. But there are there, there's a classic paper from Penn. I can't remember who wrote it, and it was really just a case series. But he really made the point: maybe the treatment's worse than the disease in terms of sedation, over sedation, prolongation mm -hmm. of length of stay, secondary pneumonias, and the whole nine yards. So um, Dick, back to you then. Um, so you're, you're doing the EEG stuff, you're having fun, you're starting to put a few modalities together. But I think that the next really big step uh, for you was the development of what we call now the CNS monitor, the Moberg CNS monitor. Uh, if, if you agree, I'm right there. Can you tell us about that, how that came to be? Sure. So that's when I left intraoperative monitoring and, you know, saw this opportunity in the ICU. And so we said we would, um, you know, we wanted to do what we did for the operating room to, to ICU. So back in those days, the, the only devices that kind of were around were, um, so you had the patient monitors, the vital signs monitors, and then you had like the Integra Camino. And then I think I told you the Lycox was just being introduced. So this is early 2000s. And, you know, just kind of getting those three devices together. So you had hemodynamics, you had ICP, and you had brain oxygen uh, was kind of our original intent. And then we added EEG to it, you know, as our own machine so we could time synchronize the EEG to those. So that's kind of how it started. And, you know, it was, it was pretty interesting. And, and just as an aside, you know, the... Um, the, I remember the the early Lycox guy over here named Fernando Usti. I don't know if you remember him, but he he worked oh, yeah. in Tegra. He and he came from uh, uh, from you know Fleckenstein's uh, company in Germany. And a lot of people in the early days of the Lycox were seeing a lot of variability in the brain oxygen, and they were saying this machine doesn't work. You know, and now we know that there's probably a lot of variability. In that case, that, we, that can be caused by all kinds of things, including seizures and stuff, you know, that correlated. And so they were probably seeing the real data. But when you first introduced that, people thought it, it didn't work. So I, that that kind of affected me. And it said, well, you know, you got to put this together and get the big picture. And I think the more we worked in this field, you know, the more I looked at the brain as a as a pizza, 
right? And you just have to have all the slices together before, you know, before you really know what's going on. And the the, the problems we face was that, you know, it's, it, it is that every hospital we went to had different types of monitors. And then, you, you know, you just, it, be, it becomes a company that, um, how, how do you make money? And we, we didn't make money. <laughs> you know, we, it's like, well, you want this, you know, the, this interface. Okay, we'll do that. Oh, you want this one? Okay, we'll do that. And, you know, and the, the whole market, as you know, for multimodal monitoring really wasn't there. And I think that was uh, the, you know, the, the 22 years I spent in that company, uh, it was a struggle because, you know, you, you had early adopters, but, you know, it, we were right in that period where, you know, uh, economics and hospitals were changing where you, you, you used to be able to sell anything to a hospital, you know, anyone wants to buy it, but then it became, you couldn't sell anything to a hospital unless it made them money or it saved them money. And, you know, that's kind of where we are now. I think you all know that. And boy, multimodal monitoring, uh, you know, there were no papers. I remember talking to people about why don't you use brain oxygen? I mean, I was such a fan of that. And they'd say, well, it's not in the guidelines. Why would I use it? And it's, you know, it's, it's sort of, um, common sense got trumped by financial sense, you know, and, you know, so we, we had to fight that battle, uh, for a long time. And it really wasn't until just a couple of years ago that, you know, these, these foundational papers, the one that, uh, gear, uh, was the first author on came out of, you know, uh, Leuven we're saying multimodal monitoring is probably where we need to be and all that. So, so it's only now, uh, you know, that I think yeah. we, the papers and, uh, yeah, George Mayfroyd. Um, well, I remember when when we were starting, it was it was very clear that there were massive connectivity issues, and you were really the pioneer, the first one to create a commercial product, and you kept building on right the the interfaces so that you could add all kinds of other devices too, including therapeutic devices, most notably the TTM devices for cooling and such. When we started at Columbia, I don't know how we figured out the interfaces, but but our, we used a, a program called ICU Pilot, if you remember that, which was a graphical user interface that did allow, um, did something that all these bedside devices made by Philips and GE and Space Labs still can't do today, which is to put multiple channels together and scale them scale them in terms of time on the x-axis the y-axis and 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 you know begin that process of looking at relationships between variables which you know i've, I've always been a big fan of um you know a, basically a calculating a prx which they do in cambridge england and almost nowhere else <laughs> but uh it's really just a scatter plot right of uh icp or, or the r the correlation uh, coefficient against uh, you know various levels of cerebral perfusion pressure. It's the uh, yeah, it's the MAP ICP relationship, right? Yeah. So um, yeah, but you also have been thinking about um, data display, graphical user interfaces. Um, where where is that going? Do you think? So yeah, it's interesting. So first of all, PRX is actually catching on. Um, a lot of pl places want to adopt that. And uh, what we're seeing, um, and, and then, you know, the next thing is the CPP op. So what, what CPP do I keep my patient at optimally right. uh, based on that? So we're seeing a lot of people want that as kind of a guide to care, uh, especially since the Cogitate trial, you know, came out and all that. So it's, it's probably more than Cambridge now. And, and those people are real good friends of mine. Peter Smolewski, who developed ICM Plus, um, stays with me when he comes to the U.S. and everything. So we're very good friends and we're work on a lot of collaboration with interfacing that into our, our uh, next product. But um, so I, Stefan, you're gonna have to ask me what the question was again. My mind kind of gets off track. So oh, just <laughs> where are we going with data display right. and, and, you know, data visualization, we'll call it. So I, I think the, the, the thing that we're working on now, so, so when I left my last company, we're now, uh, we started a, uh, you know, a cloud-based company. And what we can do with that is we we can get in a lot more data, all right? So the CNS monitor was really mostly physiology, but now we can look at medications and see how that fits in. We can look at 
you know, what did the nurse do and all that? And so again, it's building this, this pizza. And I, I think the idea is, you know, you know, we look at the heart from many different angles, right? You look at blood pressures, stroke volumes, you look at ECGs, heart rate variability, all that. You kind of want to do the same with the brain, right? You want to look at all the different angles and try to figure out where the problem is. So we're kind of, we're developing a, you know, displays for that. So um, correlations, um, some of these higher order parameters like CPP opt, um, those things. So we want to get it all together. We want to look at it in time. Uh, I want to try to compute trajectories, like where do you think the patient's going to be in the future? Those are the kind of things that we're doing. So building out the slices of the pizza in a, in a nice display that, that you can look at at the bedside. Yeah, yep. Um, well, and cloud-based though. Well, we, yeah, so that's the next step. So, you know, we the last product we did was at the bedside, and now we're moving that to the cloud where you can get more types of data. Now, it doesn't have to be a cloud in the cloud. It can be a cloud within the hospital firewall. That's where we're working with some places on that. But you have access to a lot more data. Um, the other thing that uh, I have to say is, like, we well, went back and you mentioned ICU pilot um, and then compared that to what we did. So we obviously took the... Uh, FDA route, we had to, right? And so that was a big difference in, I think, what else was out there. ICU pilot was there. There was a couple of more, a uh, couple of other um, software packages there. ICM Plus, you know, they, sure. from Cambridge is out there, of course. Um, they were they were more for researchers, but we wanted to make a clinical device. So once you once you build something that's cleared by the FDA, uh, as any mag manufacturer will tell you, it, it becomes more and more difficult to change things in it, right? So you're under this quality process and all that, and it, it just becomes hard. And so you can't innovate as fast as someone like ICM Plus or ICU Pilot. So we had those restrictions, but we, we kind of dealt with them. Um, in my new company where we're on the cloud, uh, that system is more akin to a medical record like Epic. And Epic, believe it or not, does not have to go through the FDA. So medical record systems do not have to get FDA cleared. Oh. So... Now we can innovate like crazy on this cloud system because we're not the primary source of data. And so we're working on integrating. Um, we've integrated Persist into our. So, for example, you can send our data from our cloud over to the Persist cloud and get all their data back. Um, you can also, we're working with Jed Hardings to put his uh, spreading depolarization detection algorithm in our system, you know, for people to do ECOG and on and on. We're working with like a dozen different places that have a little algorithm like Ari Urkula over in Cambridge that has this uh, product called Deep Clean. So that cleans your data. And so it's been wonderful to kind of get back into that, that kind of cowboy development, you know, where you're, yeah. you know, where, where you can do what you, what's needed and, and not what regulatory tells you to. But now we all, we do it in a very quality oriented way. We have a quality system. We follow that. It's just that, you know, we can do things without the fear of getting spanked basically. So yeah. So is, you, is your current product for sale now or is yeah, it is well, it well, it's, lab in development? Well, it's used the first couple of years. Uh, it was it's been running the boost three trial. So at about 45 sites, it sucks all the data for that. We're in the precise cap trial for anoxic coma that's out of Stanford and UPMC and and, and Maine Medical Center. And we're um, uh, we're in a bunch of other uh, trials, electro boost and all these. So that's our first uh you know, entry in the market is basically just sucking data. up. We then have, um, you know, we have a couple of hospitals now where we built out the analytics portion that are going to put it in the hospital to manage data, uh, create reports, uh, you know, periodically, you know, kind of, kind of like Mike Schmidt and you guys used to do and uh, what Brandon Foreman does, you know, you create these multimodal reports. We're trying to automate those uh, and then let people plug in algorithms. You'll be able to plug in your own Python you know, uh, code into it and and do stuff. Uh, we're working yeah. with Cambridge to integrate ICM Plus in it. So that's, that's next. Well, when I hear you say used to do, I just want to remind our listeners that in our 19 Bender ICU Westchester Medical Center, we've got a Moberg in every room. And uh, with my partners, uh, Andrew Bauer Schmidt, who's listening in today, and, and John Rosenberg, who you've met, uh, we are bringing it all back. Uh, we're we're going back to the future of uh, brain multimodality monitoring, and uh, we're really looking forward to continue to work closely with you, Dick. Two two quick things before we wrap up. We're kind of, you know, at the half hour mark. 
Uh, you have a podcast, don't you? I do. Yeah, it's uh, and it's called Dick Moberg's Neural Network, and uh, I haven't done uh, too many lately, but we were pretty active a while back, and I hope to get it back going again. Yeah, and then um, uh, for those on a personal note, for those that don't know, you're a big enthusiast of Burning Man. I, I am, and tell our listeners what Burning Man is. Some some may not even know. Well, it's it's like this big um, art festival in the desert in Nevada, and it has a long history. I think most people know what it is. Just look it up. But most people think it's just a place where there's a lot of, um, you know, drugs and rock and roll and naked people running around. And they're right, but there's a lot more. <laughs> but there's a lot more to it, you know. And um, there's there's a surprising amount of educational material uh, that or, or lectures and things in this highly creative group. And last year at Burning Man, I, I took a cue from Di Y. Olson from the Curing Coma campaign. And we ran a session that was called Coma and Consciousness. And it was with some folks from Berkeley talking about consciousness and um, a, a neuro nurse from uh, uh, Jeff Manley's group from uh, San Francisco General. And um, we did a great little talk on coma and consciousness. Yeah, actually, I saw some... Uh clips of that, you know, we're getting ready for the fourth World Coma Day coming up on uh, March 22nd. There's going to be a whole YouTube uh, uh, channel with tons of things that you can watch. And you'll be able to, uh, on the day of launch, uh, March 22nd, we're going to have some of that material, your Coma and Consciousness talks from Burning Man last year with all the mud. Exactly. Right. <laughs> okay, one, great. One quick uh, question I had. Um, yeah. I know Dr. Bowerstrom may have some questions as well. So, Dick, you've seen, uh, you've been, you've been with us, you've been in this field through the genesis of multimodality monitoring. Why should, why should an institution or a neurointensivist, um, you know, uh, do, you know, use this for their patients? In your opinion, I think it's for precision management, and that's that's the name of the game. So we have places that that they look at the ICP, and if it goes above twenty two. They don't treat uh, if the brain oxygen is is okay. And so to me, that's kind of individualizing uh, the care of the patient, all right? And so, you know, a lot of places just say, well, if it goes above, we have to we have to do something, you know, if the ICP. And you know, you know as well as I do that that uh, you know that that uh, threshold for ICP is, you know, it's it's kind of a seat of the pants threshold. <laughs> and you know, but but we have to have something. But I think you can individualize care. You can you can uh, look at how well some of your <laughs> some of your drugs are doing. So we got a case from Eric Rosenthal at Mass General. A nurse gives it. You know they see the blood pressure is low. Uh, you know give a vasopressor. The question you give a vasopressor and the blood pressure goes up. How do you know that's affecting the brain? So we have a great case showing the the blood pressure was low. The brain oxygen was low. They raised the blood pressure and they saw the brain oxygen go up. That's why you're raising the brain, the blood pressure, right? But if you're not monitoring the brain oxygen, how do you know you've raised the blood pressure to the right level? So it's it's those kind of things that you need the data to make those calls. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, um, Dick, is there anything else, any uh, last words of wisdom you want to leave us with before we wrap up? No, I'm just honored to be on this uh, esteemed podcast with you guys. So thank you very much. I I just remember the um, the T-shirt that you right uh, for for our uh, for our listeners. The shirt said, "If you don't know Moberg, you don't know Dick." Nope. Well, let me let me uh, let me correct that. If you don't monitor the brain, you don't know Dick. <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> All right. Cool. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, you. for our listeners, thanks a lot for checking in with us. And we'll, we'll be back soon with another master class.